Okay, so far it's a fairly simple example. Um, you know, there, there's a question, there's some data, and we've converted it into a number, and there's various ways of doing that. But sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes a, a, a question on a questionnaire, one numbered question, might produce more than one variable. In other words, we might not be able to represent the answers to that question in one single number. We might need more than one number to do it. So what we have to do then is produce several variables to, to represent that one question. So the easiest case is where we don't have to do that, the fixed response questions, how many cars, uh, we code as integers one to seven, you know, if, if those are the categories, sex one and two, I've, I've dealt with these already, semantic differential, um, you know, they, they ring a number between the strong and the weak, and, and we put that number in, that's dead easy, one variable, one question. What happens though if you get a more difficult situation like this one? Apparently, it looks like a categorization question that I've dealt with already, but actually, we're asking the people to tick as many as apply. So people might tick just one, they might tick two, or three, or four, or even all five, depending on how many sports they do. So it's quite possible you might get five answers, but very <coughs> likely you'll get more than one answer to this question. So in this case, we have to convert the single question into more than one variable. Now, how we do that depends on what we want from the results eventually and maybe how simple it is to do and, 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 uh, uh, and how easy it is to set the thing up. We have some choices. We can either, the first option, code each possible sport as a separate variable. So if I go back to this question here, you can see I will have a variable for football, a variable for cricket, one for swimming, hockey, and netball. So I have five variables coming from this one question. And for each of those variables, I can give it a value of yes and no, one and two, or whatever, um, which I've given you here. So if, it's, if, the, if they tick that one, it's yes, and it's uh, <coughs> given a score of one. And if they don't, it's two. Alternatively, we might say we, we, we look through all the results we've got, and actually nobody has more than three sports. So in that case, we can have three variables. The first, which, mentions, which, which codes the first sport they mention, the second, the second sport they mention, and the third, if, if they mention a third, the third one they mention, or it's left empty if they don't mention one. And for each of those three variables, we can now code one for football, two for cricket, three for swimming, four for hockey, five for netball. Now, why do that? Well, partly it might be if you've got a large number of options, so you've got 20 options and people are only ticking two or three, then it probably makes sense to, to just to, to, to have three variables that cover all the options they've taken. In my case, though, in the sports thing, this one here, I've only got five options. If I were doing this, I would have five variables. It's not a great deal of extra work to have five variables to cover this. And it, you don't lose any data, you cover everything that way. The second option, the bottom option here, of, of having just two or three extra variables, makes sense if you've got lots of options and most of them aren't used. So you have to make a judgment, and that means looking through the data set, looking at the answers you've got on the questionnaire to see what makes sense to do. As I say, very often it makes most sense to, to include all the possibles as separate variables, but sometimes it makes more sense just to have a fewer number where each of the, the, the possible answers is coded each time in each one. Okay, so that's a slightly more difficult uh, situation. By far the most difficult thing we get though is the open-ended questions. The questions where we haven't got fixed answers, where it's not a matter of ticking a box or writing in a number, we're asking people to write something in or type something in if they're online. So I'll give you an example here. What difference has coming to university made to you? And then you have a box underneath where people can write something in. The problem with this, of course, is people are free to answer in any way they want. They can use any terminology they want. They can say any number of things they want. So they're going to get different, different answers from people. Different people have different answers. Some may have the same answers as one or two others, but there'll be lots of variation between them. Now, one easy option here 
is to just enter that as text. Just enter the text into your data matrix uh, or in you know, the spreadsheet in SPSS. The term that's used in SPSS is string, so it's a string variable. And the thing about that is it allows you to have that text in there and you can look at it and you can read it and you can make notes on it and so on, but you can't do any statistics with it. You can't <coughs> summarize it in any way. You can't count things and so on and so forth. So what we often do in this case, when you've got open-ended questions, what we often do is try to categorize the answers. And that's the difficult bit, categorizing the answers. Because what you have to do is look through lots of answers to see what kinds of things people are saying and then try and come up with some categories that might cover their answers. <coughs> now, there are several ways of doing this. If you've got a small um, survey, if you're doing just 100 or 200 people, then you might look through everything you've got. You look through every single one and uh, get some ideas for, from what's going on. If you're doing a larger scale survey, talking about thousands of respondents, you might just simply look through a small subsample, perhaps 100 or 200 so, to get some ideas in that and, and then build up your categories based on that. But either way, you can see it, it involves quite a lot of work of reading through things and looking for these common answers. And it also requires, as I've said at the last point here, it requires interpretation by you. You have to think through in what, what does this mean? In what kind of ways can these things be categorised? And in some ways, the exercise here is rather like the content analysis I'll be talking about in the last couple of sessions. Oh, actually, not the last, last but one and last but two sessions uh, of, of this course. Um, the, 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 um, the content analysis approach does use this kind of way of doing things. And it's not actually too far away either from the kind of coding you do in qualitative research. The difference is... Well, perhaps I should start by saying that the, the, the similarities are that in both cases, both qualitative and in the quantitative approach, you do some interpretation. You have to read through and interpret what's going on and categorise. The difference is that in quantitative work, you end up with some numbers attached to them. So you number and then you aim to count the number of occasions that each category appears. So that the reason for doing it in quantitative is ultimately to get some numbers that you can do some stats on. So there's a different uh, end point, if you like, in coding here. But it is quite a similar activity. Let me give an example of how you might do that. Here's the question. What do you fear about global warming? And notice a big gap underneath to encourage people to write lots about it. So they, they write down what they fear about global warming. Now, the answers I've given you could be quite long, but I've, the example I've given you here is lots of sh fairly short answers. So somebody wrote flooding, somebody said being too hot, somebody else said heat waves, somebody else said saw storms, somebody else said he heavy rainfall, and so on. Somebody said restrictions on driving, some people wrote little phrases, lots of precipitation, very high fuel costs, and so on whole range of answers. Now, of course, this is only a, a small sample of what you'd actually get. In a large survey with 100 respondents, you get almost 100 different responses. One or two people might write the same things, but even those similar will be writing it in slightly different ways. Now, the activity now is to start looking through all of these and try and find some <coughs> way of categorising them. And I suspect you're already doing that. One of the things about being human is that we can't help categorising things. We look at things, oh, that's like that, that's like that, oh, that's not like that, that's, that's, dip, that's like that instead, and so on. So actually, it's a natural thing for us to do, but you have to try and do it in a way that makes sense, that's justifiable, that is a good interpretation of, of those things. Now, I've done this already. I've had a look through this. Well, I made them up and, and created them, so I, I know what I'm, I'm doing here. And I've gone through these, and I think there's some ways of categorising into about three, maybe four different categories. So I've already done this. I've read all the answers, and I've categorised them. And I think I can assign each answer into a category. And I've got these three categories here, one, two, and three. Things about weather and climate change, things about economic change, things about health risks. So here's one way of interpreting those data. So if I go back to the previous listing, you can see things to do with weather, well, fl flooding, being too hot, heat waves and so on. Um, things to do with economic costs, um, higher fares. Um, uh, what else is there? One or two others. I can't spot them all now. Um, very high fuel costs, economic things. And things to do with health, you know, babies dying, old people suffer, and things of that kind. 
So I can categorise them. And the way I do that would be something like this. I've used colour here to do it. But if you're actually doing this on a questionnaire, of course, you assign the number to them. So the first th person who answers flooding, they get given the number one, because that's, the, that's the category they fall into. Uh, the person who answered food costs more uh, is given the number two, because it's the second category, economic change. So you can see, I mean, this is, obviously, I've done the work for you here, that the looking through, the thinking about it. Uh, if you're doing this on a real questionnaire, it takes a lot more work than that. It's quite a, a, a tedious thing to do, but it pays off in the end because you can then class classify them. And you can say, for example, here, just looking at this, even just by looking at the colours, you begin to get a feel for what's <coughs> going on here. When people are asked about climate change, when they're asked that question, I just gave them the, what do you fear about global warming? Most people, it seems, uh, give you answers to do with weather and climate change. But quite a lot, substantial proportion, also talk about economic change too. But relatively few talk about health changes. So already, just by looking at the frequencies, you're beginning to get an understanding of how people would answer that question. And that's the reason for doing this coding, is you can come up with that kind of a description of the kind of answers people are giving. So not just the categories themselves, that's interesting, but also the frequencies of the categories can be an important way of describing those answers. OK, so that's probably the most complex one of dealing with uh, open-ended questions where you end up with, with, with strings of writing. You can give up altogether and just enter them as text strings into, the, into to, uh, your, your data matrix or your SPSS spreadsheet. Uh, but that's giving up, really. You really want to do more with them than that. And categorising in this way is, is one way of doing that. One other thing to think about here, going back to the, the, the point I made just now about going from one question into several variables, you may also have to do that here as well. Now, just looking through these things, you might think, I've been a bit simplistic with my categorization. Um, some of these look like they could be both to do with economic change and health, or to do with climate and economics. Um, I mean, I don't know, restrictions on flights, is that just economic? Or is that to do with weather? I don't know. Um, what other ones that I spot here? Um, food shortages. I called that an economic change. But you could say, actually, that could be a health change, too. If there really are food shortages, people might starve. Um, so maybe that should be a health change as well. So actually, maybe here, it's not sufficient to categorize into one variable we may need to allow categorization into two or three variables because people might come up with answers that fall into two categories or even, actually quite often you find this with open-ended questions, people give you two answers. Somebody writes down, not just flooding, but also um, they write down babies dying. Flooding and babies dying. And you've got two answers to the same question. So you're back to that situation of having to create two variables. Now, of course, this process means you can do that when you code them in this way, you can say, ah, oh, this is a, a one and a two, so I need two variables to keep all that data. Or if somebody gives you three answers, you obviously need three answers. So the first thing they mention, the second thing they mention, the third thing they mention, in that way. So you can see how it gets quite complicated sometimes with open-ended questions with multiple answers. You need to have, first of all, this coding process, uh, this assigning numbers to the categories you create, and then secondly, you might need to generate more than one variable on the basis of that. Just some other bits of advice about this. When you're doing this kind of coding, the temptation is to have lots and lots of categories, to look for fine differences between the answers. Usually there's no point in that. I wouldn't have more than about <coughs> 10 categories. Use other for the less frequent ones, the, the ones that you know, only one or three people mention kind of thing. Makes most sense to have half a dozen or so categories if you can. Um, but you sometimes might want more. Um, so don't be too kind of fine-grained about it. Of course, you can categorise people's answers into using different words for everything, and you get lots and lots of you know, 30, 40 categories, if you want, from people. That's not really of any great help. You really want to categorise into meaningful groupings, and having too many is a bad idea. And I've just said that last point, sorry, I've covered it already, that sometimes you need more than one variable if people give several answers, which, which I have to say they do. If you invite people to write in their answers in an open-ended question, they quite often mention more than one thing. 
Now, there is a way around that, and actually in the question itself, you can tell them not to do that. You can say, what is the most important thing about? Give one answer only. Or what do you fear about? What's the most important thing that you, you, you fear? Give one answer only. Really encourage them just to give one thing. Um, but actually, very often, you want to encourage the answers. So you want to encourage them to put in other things too. So you do end up with people writing in two or perhaps three things in, 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 their, uh, in the boxes as an answer. Okay, so you have to code that in that way. Yeah.